Cholin Daf Zayin Amur Aleph. We said yesterday that Rabbeinu HaKadosh, her testimony in the name of Rav Meir that Beit Sha'an is not considered Eretz Yisrael, and therefore you don't have to take off Meiser from anything from Beit Sha'an. And we said that Rebbe drew legitimacy to making such a, an innovation against the status quo from Chizkiyahu HaMelech. <clears throat> and we learn from here that, um, like Rebbe says on the top of the page, Afani, <clears throat> so to myself, my, my father's left me place to make my own decrees, make my own innovations. Just because my fathers didn't do it, it does not mean that I'm not allowed to do it. <clears throat> and from here we learn that it says something innovative in Allah that no one ever heard before, that's against the status quo. <clears throat> Some say, <clears throat> which means we don't turn him away. <clears throat> Some say, <clears throat> which means we don't forsake him. <clears throat> And some say, We don't call him a Balgaiva. We don't say, Oh, you're Hori, and that's why you're able to say something that's so innovative. Manda Umar Mazikin, the one who uses the term Mazikin, the Ksiv, he's, he's drawing on the Pasuk that the Choshen was not allowed to move from the Ephoid. The Pasuk says, The Choshen shouldn't move. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't move him away. You shouldn't push him away. This time, Manda Umar Ain Mazikin, I say, The Ksiv, Hashem will never forsake Klaal Yisrael. So you see the word znicha means forsake, so too, do not forsake this time of just because he said something innovative. Uman Domer Mazchichin, the one who uses the term Mazchichin, Ditna, he's drawing from the term used in the Mishnah and Saitam, Mishirabu Zechuchay Alev, when the Balei Gaiva um, became a lot, Rabu Machlekes Beisrael, they became much Machlekes in the nation of Yisrael. Okay, so this is the different terminologies of, of, of how we say it. Now, Maskif law, Yudr Bered Reb Shimon Ben Pazi. He's going to ask a question on Rabbeinu HaKadosh's opinion that Beit Shan is not considered Eretz Yisrael. The Pasuk says, Umi ikel lamanda Omar, Umi ikel lamanda Omar, is there an opinion that Beit Shan is not Eretz Yisrael, Beit Shan is not from Eretz Yisrael, Vaksiv, it says in the Pasuk, V'lo harish menashe es Beit Shan ves ben Osel, Menashe did not get rid of the inhabitants of Beit Sha'an and its daughters. Literally, daughters it means uh, it uh, means the cities around Beit Sha'an, Beit Ta'anach, Beit Menaseha, and the city of Tanach, and its figurative daughters. So, what do you see from here? You see from here that Menashe was supposed to get rid of the inhabitants of Beit Sha'an. Why? Because it was considered Eretz Yisrael. Instead, he didn't. Instead of get rid of, getting rid of them, he used them to work for him and to pay taxes, and that was considered. A bad thing that Menashe did. He was supposed to get rid of them because it was supposed to be considered Eretz Yisrael and was supposed to be annexed onto Eretz Yisrael. And so you see, Beit Shan is considered Eretz Yisrael. The Gemara says, no, 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 that's not a proof. Ishtamite, this Rabbi Yehudu asked the question, he forgot, had the Omer Rabbi Shimon ben Al Yakim Mishum Rabbalotim ben Pedos. Shaomar Mishum Rabbalotim ben Shemora, what was said? Harbeg Krochim Kovshum Oil Mitzrayim. There are many cities that Oil Mitzrayim, when they came up to Mitzrayim, from its time with Yoshua, they captured many cities and they were Makadash, they made it into Eretz Yisrael. The Lake Kivshim Oli Bavel, but Oli Bavel, after the second base of Mikdash, after the first base of Mikdash was destroyed, the Jews went down to Bavel. When they came back to Eretz Yisrael to build the second base of Mikdash, they didn't capture everything that the Oli Mitzrayim captured. They left a few things out. And therefore, in, you're right, Bet She'an, in, in the time of the first base of Mikdash, in the time of Benasha, it was considered holy. Because the Oil of Mitzrayim captured it, and therefore it became part of Eretz Yisrael. And, that, and that's what it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be Eretz Yisrael. But Oil of Bavel, um, when the Klaisel came back from Bavel, they did not capture it. And Rebbe holds, Rabbi Noah Kaddish holds, Kasavar Kedusha Rishayinu Kitschel Shaita. The first Kedusha, meaning when Bnei Yisrael came up from Mitzrayim and they sanctified the cities. By ca through capturing the cities, they sanctified them only temporary, but it wasn't sanctified forever. 
Meaning, when they left Eretz Yisrael, when the first base of Megiddo was destroyed and they left, so the Kedusha left the cities too. The Hinichum, and when the Oilei Babel came back up, they left these cities out. They did not sanctify these cities, even though previously they were sanctified. How come? So that the poor people during Shemitah would be able to have somewhere to grow uh, food. If everything around you is considered Eretz Yisrael, so come Shemitah, poor people are really in a bad shape because they don't have any food to eat. Therefore, if we leave a certain place where people are allowed to plant even on Shemitah a year because it's not really Eretz Yisrael, so therefore um, it might help the poor people. There might be more food. And therefore, we left out Beit Sha'an. Omer Lerab, Yimur Lerab asks, uh, says How do you know from the fact that Rav Meir ate a leaf of a vegetable that he really holds that the whole Beit Sha'an is not Chayv and Maisar because it's not considered Eretz Yisrael. All he ate was a leaf of a of a vegetable. And a leaf of, veg- of a vegetable is not Chayv and Maisar because uh, it's considered Achilas Arai. Only a serious type of eating is mechay of the food in Miser. But if all you do is you pick a leaf off the floor and you eat it, it's not chayv in, in Miser. And there wouldn't be an issue of, of demai of anything. So how come you're able to bring a proof from Rav Meir ate a leaf? That's not a proof. No. What must have been was that he ate it from a, a bundle of leaves, and once it's bundled up into, into a bundle of leaves, it's already considered chayv, utnan, it says in the Mishnah, yerak hanegad, if you have a vegetable that is bundled up, mishayegad, it's chayv in miser once it's uh, put into a bundle. V'dilma lava it says the Gemara, maybe, maybe Rav Meir, you bring a proof from the fact that Rav Meir ate something, maybe it was by mistake, dilma lava maybe he, he didn't have in mind that he had to be master, which means that he made a mistake and he really should have been master, right? he just forgot about it. Where it says, no, if even the animals of Tzadikim in HaKadosh Baruch Hu to Kalal Yodan, even if the animals of the Tzadikim HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not bring a pitfall to them, and we'll see where we see that with the donkey of, of Pinchas Benyar, Tzadikim Atzman, for sure Tzadikim themselves, the righteous people, like Kol and Hashem, would never bring about them to eat something that's not allowed to be eaten, and therefore from the fact that Rav Meir ate it, must be, it was mutter. So you can bring a proof and don't tell me Rav Meir forgot. Uh, the Gemara says, Vidilma Isar Aleya Mimakam Acher. Maybe Rav Meir ate the leaf of the vegetable because he was Me'aser. He really did take off Meiser, but someone else, somewhere else. He had in mind that the food in his house, the vegetables in, that, in his house, should be considered Meiser for what he's eating right now. Says the Gemara, that can't be because Leinech Shitu Chaverim. Literem shlemin amukov. Chaver meaning tamid chachamim. We do not suspect them for being toyrim uh, truma for or or meiser for being for separating meiser shlemin amukov when it's not close by. Min amukov means close by, and basically we're not supposed to separate meiser from something that's not right here. Because if it's right here, people realize what you're doing. But if it's not here, people don't realize that you're eating that you really were meiser. Rashi says that the reason why we're not allowed to be so, why why we're not allowed to be tired why you're not supposed to uh, give meiser separate meiser from something that's not in front of you that's not near you because maybe it's gone maybe it's, it may, you think it's there you're you're relying on the fact that in your warehouse you have vegetables but maybe it was burnt up maybe something happened to it and now you're going to be eating tevel because nothing was uh, you didn't really separate it onto anything because that thing's gone. Um, so therefore, we don't suspect them to be for, from donating uh, donating miser from something that's not in the proximity of of what he's being measer from. Says the Gemara, says the Gemara. Okay, so you know that he didn't donate anything from somewhere far, but maybe he had in mind for. The other side of the actual leaf, meaning he ate part of the leaf, and the other, the other part of the leaf, he said that sh- that should be considered miser, and that part he wasn't going to eat. He had one; he only ate one part of the leaf, and the other part of the leaf he had in mind for it to be considered miser, and therefore really it was it was separated. 
The Gemara says, Look at this, uh, look how great the man who, who testified about Rav Meir. This is Rabbi Yeshua ben Zaruz, the brother-in-law of Rav Meir. Because such a great man uh, testified that, look, Rav Meir ate, and, and he wanted to draw from there that Beit Shan is not considered Eretz Yisrael. Must be he was, he had a, a, a 100% tight proof that, that really Rav Meir believed that Beit Shan was not Eretz Yisrael, and there was no way out. So he knew that Rav Meir didn't have in mind for the other part of the, the top part of the leaf to be considered uh, Meiser. He knew that, that Rav Meir absolutely did not separate Meiser regarding this leaf that he ate, and therefore he was able to bring a proof from that really that really Rav Meir held Beit Shan is not considered Eretz Yisrael. Okay. Now the Gemara goes on to explain the thing we've mentioned a couple of times. What's this story about the animal of a tzaddik that did not eat not kosher. What's going on here? What is this animal tzaddikim? Rav Pinchas ben Yoyer, Rav Pinchas ben Yoyer, he was a Tana, have a ka'azil lepidyan shuin. He was on the way to redeem someone who was captured. It was a mitzvah, a pidyan shuin. Pagabe beginoi nahara. He approached the Ginoi River. Amar le Ginoi. He said, Ginoi, chalok li meimach. Separate your waters, the Evarbach, and let me go through. He didn't have a boat, obviously. He couldn't go through. He needed the river to part. So he asks the river to part its waters. The Evarbach, and I'll pass by. Amar le atoholich lasus and ton koncha. What do you mean? You're going to do a mitzvah, right? You're going to do the mitzvah. I'm also doing what, what my commander, meaning God, wants from me. Meaning God wants the river to flow naturally. And you want me to, to, to now go against what God wants from me. You, you're going to try to, to redeem the, this person who's captured. You can try to pay off the captors and, and, and bring back the person. But you're Suffolk Isa, Suffolk Yata Isa, you don't know for sure you're going to be able to do it, you're going to try. It's not a definite thing that you're going to accomplish what you're setting out to do. Ani Vada I am for sure doing what God wants for me. I know for sure that God wants me to, to, to make sure this river flows naturally. And if I do that, and I know I can do that, and I'm going to do that for sure, uh, then I know that I'm accomplishing what Hashem wants for me. So why should I... Stop what God wants me to do because you might do what God wants to do. Uh, so Rupinach says, says back to him, if you do not part, if you don't, if the water doesn't split, I will decree upon you. He was going to curse the river that the, the, no water should pass by the river forever. So the river split. Havahu Gavra, there was a person there that have a Dori Chiti Lepischa that was holding, he was carrying wheat for Pesach. Amalei Chaloklei, also you should split for him. Nami. Also, why? Lahai, Chalok Lei Nami Lahai, you should split also for this guy, the be Mitzvah Asik. Because he's dealing with a Mitzvah, he's bringing wheat for Pesach, so you should, so Pinchas Benyar tells the river, you should, you should split for him too. Amalei, uh, Chaloklei, so he, so he, so he split for him too. The river split for this guy too. Havahu Taya, there was an Arab merchant, the love of Adayu, that was accompanying them too. It was going in the same direction. Amr Lai, Chalok Lai, you should split for him too. Chalok Lai, Nami Lai, you should split also for him. Why? Why should you split for him? Is he doing a mitzvah? He's not doing a mitzvah. But, but the low lema, that, that they shouldn't say, they shouldn't say, people shouldn't say, Kach Aisin Lubnei Levaya. This is what uh, you do to people who accompany you. Someone who accompanies you, you're supposed to act nicely to him. And over here, the river is going to split only for us too and not, and not for this guy. So Chalok Lai, the river split for him too. Amrav Yosef says of Yosef, Rav Yosef comments about this part of the story. How much greater is this man, Pinchas Pinyar, even more than Moshe and 600,000 Jews? The Ilu Hasam goes over there, Chad Zimna. Over there, the river split only once. The Kriya Siamps was only once. And over here, he got it to split three times for each, three, for each person. Says the Gemara, no. Vidim Hocha Nami Chad Zimna. Maybe over here also it was only one time. Ella Kimoshe Vishisin Ravavan. So so when Rabbi Yosef uh, said it, he didn't mean he was more than Moshe. It means it was just like just like Moshe. And basically what Rabbi Pinchas Ben Yari was telling the river was um, split for me and stay open for the next two people. Not that it split separately three times for each person. Okay.
So continuing the story of uh, Pinchas ben Yor, Ikla he gets Lahu Shpiza to this inn. He had to, he stayed by an inn. Ramulei Sari Lechamer they gave his his donkey they gave him barley lo yachal he didn't eat chavtinhu they um, sifted it so that it would take out all the, the the bad things they thought maybe the donkey wasn't eating it because it was dirty lo yachal he still didn't eat it nakrinhu they took out all the stones they made sure there was nothing else there except for the barley still lo yachal Amar lehu so Pinchas Ben Yar says Dilma lo yme asro nasrinu maybe you didn't take away miser from these from this barley. And that's why he didn't eat. Asrinu, so they took Meister and the Ochal. And the donkey ate once they took away Meister, they took off Meister, once they separated Meister from the barley. Omar, so Rapinchas Vinyar said, Aniyazu, this poor donkey, Hayleches Las Eisritzon Kaina, is going to do its master's will. Va'atem Achil Naiset Falim, it's doing what it's supposed to do, and you give her Tevel, you give the donkey Tevel. Um, Tevel is, is uh, produce that Truman Meiser was not taking off. It's uh, it's also to eat. You're giving you're giving this animal Tevel. Now asks the Gemara, Omi Mechayva is the animal Chayav in Dmai. Basically, the inn that Rapinchas Ben stayed by was an inn of an Amoritz who we can't know if they separated Meiser or not. And Chachamim said we have to separate again. That's what Dmai is. And the Gemara wants to know, are you, are you obligated to make sure that your animal doesn't eat Demai? Vatnan, doesn't it say in the Mishnah, Lokeach Lezera, if you take to plant, if you, if you buy produce to plant, or Ula Behema, or for an animal, you want to feed it to an animal, the Kemach Lairas, or you buy flour to uh, process skins, V'shemin l'ner, or oil for a candle, v'shemin l'asuch boy, or oil to, to, l'asuch boy asakelim, to smear onto uh, vessels, then you're patr ma'ad demai, why? Because you didn't buy it to eat it. All right, so you see over here that if you feed demai to an animal, if you bought something to feed it to an animal, so then it's fine. You don't have to separate miser from demai. The Gemara says, Ha'it Allah, no, we learned about this. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan said, Loshan Allah shalakhan, we didn't learn this previous halacha, only when you took it originally for a behemoth, so then you do not have to separate Meiser again. Uh, you don't have to separate Meiser from the Dmai. But if you originally took it for a man, and then you decided, no, you're going to give it to your animal, the behemoth, then it's still Chayav Le'aser. Vatanya, we have a Brysa that says the same thing. If you take fruit from the Shuk, La'achila. To eat for a man, for a person to eat it, but then you changed your mind and you decided to give it to your animal. You should not give it in front of your animal. Not in front of your friend's animal. So if you have demai, if you buy the demai for yourself, and then you give the behema, then you still have to take off miser from the demai. But if you buy it originally with the intention to give it to an animal, so then you do not have to take off. Um, demai. You don't have to take off Meiser from the Demai. And therefore, what we're saying over here is in this story of Pinchas Benyar, the innkeeper originally bought this barley for humans, for human consumption. But then they decided they're going to feed it to the animal. They're going to feed it to, to the Hamar. And the Hamar refused to eat it because we learned to, over here that if you originally buy it with the intention to feed to animals, uh, to feed to humans, so then even if you end up giving it to animals, you still have to take off Meiser from the Demai. Now, what seems to overhear from the Gemara is that if it was Tevel, if, the, if it was actual Tevel, if, if we weren't dealing with Demai, and if you knew for sure that there was no, uh, that no one took off away the Meiser from the, uh, from the produce at all, so it would be considered Tevel, then, then the animal would not be allowed to, to eat it. And this is not because an animal can eat kosher. An animal uh, can eat not kosher. An animal is allowed to eat not kosher. You can feed an animal levelus, trephus, um, basa bukhalav, you, you can't because you're getting hana from it, but uh, other isurim, chazer, anything, any non-kosher thing, you're allowed to feed your animal. Only humans are not allowed to eat non-kosher foods, not animals. However, what's going on over here is that the reason why 
you're not allowed to feed your donkey Tevel is because Tevel and Truma have a prohibition of having Hano'ashel Kilo. Hano'ashel Kilo means that you're gaining, you're, you're having um, benefit from Tevel in a way that depreciates or destroys the Tevel. Meaning you're allowed to sell Tevel, you're allowed to make business with Tevel, but, but you're not allowed to have benefit in a way that destroys it. For example, feeding it to an animal, you're having benefit from Tevel. And um, because you're having, uh, you're having benefit from Tevel and by giving it to an animal and the animal eats it and destroys it, consumes it fully. And that's called Hanash al Kiloy and that's considered Asr. And therefore, and therefore th that's why it would have been considered Asr for the donkey to eat it. It's not really because the donkey is obligated not to eat. Um, the, the, the donkey is obligated to eat kosher. The donkey is not obligated to eat kosher at all. It's just, it would have been usher to give this animal this demai because it's, because it's considered hanoa shil Okay. Okay. So Shoma Rebbe, Rebbe heard that Pinchas bin Yoyer was in the area. Nafak Lapi, he goes to greet him, he goes towards him. Omar Lay, uh, Rebbe tells him, Ritzoncha Sa'oda Etzli, could you please eat by me? He wanted to invite him for a meal to eat by him. Omar Lay, uh, Omar Lay told him back, Hein Tzavu Panecho. Hey, Omar Lay, Hein. He tells him, yes, I'll come eat by you. Tzavu Panecho Shal Rebbe. So Rebbe's face glowed. He was so excited that Pinchas Minyar was going to come to him. Omar Lay, so Pinchas Minyar tells him back, well, he saw his face glowing so much. He says, Kim Duma Ata, do you think, that I um, have vowed of, from not getting benefit from Yisrael. Basically, everyone knew that Pinchas Vinyar, whenever you invited him, he would never come to eat by you. He did not want to eat by anyone else's suda. He only wanted to eat his own food. He didn't want to eat from anyone else. And therefore, um, when Rebbe heard the, that uh, Pinchas Vinyar said yes to his invitation, he got very excited. So then, Pinchas Benyar says, do you really think that, I'm, that I've, I have vowed that I will not benefit from anyone, from any Jew? Yisrael Kedoshim him. Yisrael are Kedoshim, they're holy people, I would for sure benefit from them. I have no issue benefiting, be benefiting from them. But, Yesh Rotze, there's some people who really want to invite me, and they want to give me food. Ve'en lo, but he really doesn't have, so I can't take from him. Ve'yesh, she'yesh lo, but some people have, they do have money, they do have food to give me. Ve'en Rotze, but he really doesn't want to give me. Uksiv, it says in the Pasuk, Don't eat bread with, don't eat bread with evil bread. No, Don't eat evil bread. I'm sorry, the way the Pasuk goes like this. Don't eat bread to, of someone who has an evil eye, meaning who's someone who's stingy. Don't eat the bread of someone who's stingy. Al tilcham, don't eat the bread es lechem ra'ayin of someone who is a has an evil eye who's stingy. Al titav limat amotav and do not desire his delicacies. Ki kimoi shar ben afshoi. Cain who, because he's bitter in his heart. Um, Echol uh, say your malach will tell you eat and drink v'liboy balimoch, but his heart isn't really with you. So the pasuk in in Mishlei is saying that do not eat from someone who who is stingy. He doesn't really want to give you, even if he has, but still he does not want to give you. Do not eat from him. Do not eat from him because he really does not want to give you, and he'll be bitter. But he says, so that's them. That's why I can't eat by everybody. Because some of them have, they don't want to give. Some of them don't have, and they want to give. So I can't take from, I can't take from them. But you, Rebbe, Rebbe Noah Kodesh, Pinchas Vinyar tells Rebbe, you have no problem going to your house. Because Ata Reitze, you do, I see you really do want uh, me to eat by you. V'yesh Lecha, and also you have, you have the money, and therefore I would be willing to eat by you. Miyo Hashta, however, right now, Masar I am in a rush. The Bimil said the mitzvah katarachna, because I am... Dealing with right now with a something with a mitzvah, he was dealing with Pidyan Shvuin, Shvuin, and he's busy with that. I can't come right now. Ki Hadarna, when I'm on the way back, when I come back, Asina Ailono Legaboch, I'll come and, and go up to your house, to you. Ki also, when he comes back, so Pinchas Binyar went to do his thing, he came back. Isrami, 
it happened to be that all behu kisro that he goes he went with to a specific he went to Rebbe's house through a specific doorway the habu kaimin bay that 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 right by that doorway could naisu chavarta white mules were standing there white mules were standing by that doorway so Omar he says the malach hamavis the vesa shalzeh the angel of death is in this house. He saw them and he, and he said that they're like the angels, angels of death. They're death incarnate. Because we'll see later on, the Gemara says they're very, they're very dangerous. They can be very damaging to humans. And therefore he said, the angel of death is in this house. And I would eat it. I would, I'm not, I'm, and I'm going to eat by him. He didn't want to eat by him. Shama Rebbe, so Rebbe heard, Nofak Ape. he goes out to greet him. Okay, you don't want, you don't like them? I shouldn't have them? Okay, I'll sell them. No, whoever you send it to, whoever you sell it to, you're gonna be over lifne because you're giving it to him, and he has it. He can't have it either, and you're putting a stumbling block in front of a blind person. You're causing someone else to sin. So Rabbi says, "Okay, I'll send it to the forest and I'll I'll make it hefker. I'll relinquish my ownership on them and just let it go." So he tells him back, "No, mafshet tezeka. Also, you're creating uh, creating." It's going to be a lot of damage because if someone goes to the forest, they're very dangerous. They'll they'll harm them. So he says, "Akar nalehu." Okay, so I would um, I'll, I'll take off their hooves. I'll cut off their hooves so that they won't be so strong, and if they kick, it won't hurt so much. But uh, it 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 still be able to you you know you can still use it because. Uh, they can still thresh with it. They, they can still do things, but uh, I'll just take off their uh, their hooves. So he says, no, Ika, Tsar Bali Chaim. Because when you take off their hooves, it's going to hurt, and it's considered Tsar Bali Chaim. So he says, Katil no lehu. So I'll kill them. It's fine, I'll just get rid of them. He says, no, Ika Baltashvas. Then it's, then it's Baltashvas. So Hava Kamevatash Bey Tuva. So Rebbe was... Um, Nagging him a lot. Mivatish means he, he was asking a lot. Uh, bitush is a, is a usually Kabbalistic term. It's a very rare word that we see this here. Havaka Mivatish Bey Tuva. He was um, he was uh, nagging him a lot. He wanted him to come and eat. Uh, Pilchas Vinyar refused to come to eat at the house of someone who had these mules that were that were so dangerous. And uh, he was he was still nagging him. Please come. What happened was, was that the floor rose up into a mountain and the mountain separated him and Rebbe. Basically, they couldn't, uh, um, he was separated. A miracle happened and they were, and they were separated. Uh, and Rebbe cried, If even in their life, this is what happens. If even in, in the life of a tzaddik, this is, uh, this is how his will is fulfilled. For sure, in his death. Rebbe understood, really, that what was going on over here was that Pinchas Vinyar, like we're going to see later, did not want to eat by anyone else's house. He really did not want to benefit from anyone else's money. And therefore, really, he was looking for every excuse not to have to eat by Rebbe's house. And, and, and Rebbe is pointing out that you see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings about what a tzaddik wants. And he was, he was able to find an excuse and a reason and this mountain sprout, sprouted out of the ground in order so that Pinchas uh, Yari will not have to eat by someone else's house. Um, now we're going to bring a, a proof um, where we know that, that, that uh, in their death, in the tzaddik's death, he's even greater than when while he's alive. Tzaddikim are greater in their death. More than when they're alive. They were burying. There was, it's a pasuk in Melachim that talks about uh, people that were burying a person. And they saw the the group of soldiers. They just threw a man into the kever of Elisha. They threw it to the kever of Elisha. And the body went and touched Ha'ish. The body of the man that they threw, that they were burying anyway, it was a dead body. They were throwing it into the pit. And that body went and touched the bones of Elisha. That's where Elisha was buried. And he... And he, uh, and he got up. He was resurrected. He gets up, he's res- because his, 
he was dead, but because his body touched Elisha's uh, bones, so he was resurrected. And he gets up on his feet. So you see over here that Elisha was greater in his death than in his life, because in his life, when he resurrected the um, Shunamis's daughter, uh, the Shunamis's son, the son that uh, the kid that Elisha resurrected, he had to he had to lay on him by us and pival pive novali nov, and and um, he, he had to work on it much harder. And and the kid sneezed seven times. Over here, all the body had to do was touch Elisha's bones and, re and already it uh, was resurrected. It was much easier. So you see, he's greater. His power was greater in his death. His power of resurrection was greater in his death. It came much easier than in his life. Says the Gemara, Omerli Rav Popo Le'abai, Rav Popo says to Abai, V'dilma, L'kiyume be'brechasa de'eliyahu. Maybe it's not that no, really, uh, he's not, he wasn't better. Uh, Elisha wasn't better. It wasn't because when he was dead, his power was even more. But it's because Elio Hanavi blessed him and said, uh, when Elisha requested from Elio, right before Elio died, Elisha requested that he will have double the amount of spirit, double the amount of Ruach HaKodesh than Elio. May I please have double of your spirit onto me? And Elio promised him that he was going to have it. So Elio blessed him that he was going to have it. And therefore, Elio, Elio Novi resurrected one person. And when Elisha got the blessing that he was going to have double the spirit of Elio, so he had to have resurrected two people. Says the Gemara, Dilma de Elio. Maybe it wasn't because a dead person is not gr is greater than a live person even that a tzaddik is greater in his death and his, his life. <clears throat> Maybe the whole reason why Elio, uh, why Elisha had to resurrect this person was to fulfill Elio's blessing. Elio um, was requested by Elisha. He asked Elio to give him that he should have double Elio's spirit, and then Elio blessed him with it. So maybe Elio only resurrected one person and Elisha needed to resurrect two. And therefore, <clears throat> Elisha, in order to fulfill uh, Elio's blessing, he needed to have resurrected another person. And that's why this person who fell onto his grave was resurrected, was to fulfill Elio's blessing. Not because a tzaddik is, better in his, is, is greater in his death than in his life. Amrle, the Gemara says, Yehachi Hainu Tanya is... If so, is this why is this why the Brisa says Al Ragl of Amal Beis Aloi Halach? It doesn't it, that that doesn't make sense because the Brisa says that even though the pasuk says Al Ragl of Amal, he stood up, but the Beis Aloi Halach he did not go home, meaning he wasn't really resurrected 100. percent He got up, he walked away from the grave, and he died. The point was just to get get the body away from Elisha's um, bones, um, but really it could not count as a real resurrection, and therefore don't tell me this was a fulfillment of. The doubling of spirit onto Elisha. El Kain, so in what way, asks the Gemara, in what way was it actually fulfilled? Kedam Rabbi Yechanan, like Rabbi Yechanan says, Shari Patsaras Naaman, that he um, healed, Elisha healed the Tsaras, the leprosy of Naaman. Shishkul Kemes, because someone who has Tsaras is considered a like a dead person. Therefore, when Naaman, the king, king Naaman had, a, had Tsaras and Elisha healed him, uh, that was considered um, like a resurrection, and that was the second resurrection that, that made him have double spirit of uh, then Elio. That's why he needed double spirit. Shinemar, how do we know that a that a someone as Saras is considered like dead? It says by Miriam, Moshe asked Hashem, unless he commits, he should not be like a dead person, and she had Saras. Okay, Amr Rabbi Shimon Levi, Lamanik Rishman Yemen, why are they called Yemen? Why are mules called Yemim? She mustn't tell us Alabrias because their fear is upon all creations. Basically, they're they're very fearful. Darab Khanina. So Yemim are considered uh Yemim is Miloshan Ema, fear. Uh asks uh Dhamra Bhina like Bhina says, Miyo my Laisha Alani Odam, in all my in all my days, no one ever asked me regarding a Al Makas Preda on a on a um on a hit, if they got hit by a preda, um, levana by a white mule, the and he lived. Meaning, they used to ask him medical questions, and whenever anyone asked me about a medical question about 
a bruise they had from a white mule, he never lived after that. That person always died. Asks the Gemara, what do you mean? We see that people live. What are you talking about? Says the Gemara, Ema the Chayis. Says the Gemara, um, what Rabbi Chanina said, does that the bruise doesn't heal. The bruise doesn't live, meaning the bruise doesn't heal. But of course the person can still live, and all Rabbi Chanina meant that the bruise, the, the bruise that comes from being hit by a white mule will never heal. Asks the Gemara, what are you talking about? So we do see that it is healed. Says the Gemara, no. The Chivrin Reish Karayu Kamrinan. We mean, when did Rabbanina mean that it never gets healed? Is if you have a mule that the, the, top, the top of their feet are, are white. That type of mule, it's a specific type of, of, of white mule that only the top of the feet are white. That's the type of mule that we're saying that does not have. Uh, that uh, it, the bruise cannot heal. Now the Gemara continues, because we mentioned Rabbi Hanina, we're going to say another thing from Rabbi Hanina. Enoid Milvadoi. The Pasuk says, there's no one else besides for God. There are no other powers aside from God. Amr Rabbi Hanina v'afiluk shafim. Even magic, even sorcery. He's saying, there's no power in sorcery um, that can do anything, and because there's the only power is God. Um, says the Gemara, he eats it so. There was this one lady, Dehavas Kamahadra, she would, she would follow Rab Khanina Lemishkal Afra to take dust from the Mitutse Kari from under the feet de Rab Khanina Rab Khanina. Amrale, uh, she was obviously gonna do some type of witchcraft and wizardry with the dust that was under his feet. So Amrale told him, Shkule, take, take dust, let me stay in Milsa, you're not gonna be able to do anything to me. Nothing's gonna happen. Ain Oid There's no one there's no other power except for God. It says in the Pasik. Uh, asks the Gemara, how, how could Rabbi Hanina say so uh, strongly that there is that there are no other powers other than God and Kshafim and magic won't affect him in any way? Why are they called Kshafim? Shemakhishin Pamalya Shemala. It's a play on words. Kshafim is a play on words of Makhishin Pamalya Shemala. They um, weaken the Legion of Heaven, meaning all the Malachim and, and, and Hashem. It, it Kavyochel weakens Hashem. So you see that that uh, Kshafim, witchcraft, does have some type of power. Um, so says the Gemara, Shani Reb Chanina, Reb Chanina is different than Efisha's Chusei. I mean, Reb Chanina was confident that it wouldn't affect him because he had a lot of merit. But other people might be affected by it. Vam Reb Chanina, another state, statement from Reb Chanina, Eina Adam Negev, it's Bani Milmata, a person doesn't stub his, his, his finger, meaning a person doesn't stub his toe downstairs. In this world, Elim Kane, Machrizan Allah bin Mala. Unless it was already decreed upon him from Shamayim that he was going to stub his toe. Shinemar me Hashem in Tzadigavar Konanu. From Hashem, the, the uh, footsteps of a man are already planned. And a man, he won't, a man what, what does he understand about his path? Meaning everything is already predetermined um, by Hashem that, uh, that he's going to stub his toe. Amr Abel Lazar. Dam nikuf marze kedam oila. The blood that comes from stubbing your toe is is marze, which means atones for sins, just like the, the actual blood of of an ola offering. Amarava begudal yimin has to only be in the right toe. Uv nikuf sheni, and the second time you hit it. Why? So the right toe, Rashi explains, is because the the right foot is usually stronger, and therefore when you stub it, it hurts even more because it was it was done with more strength. It was hit with more strength. And it has to be Nikov Sheni. It has to be the second time where it really hurts. And that's only if he's on the way to do a mitzvah and he stubs his toe. So then we say that it's considered a kapara like, like a carbon. They said on a pinchas binyor that uh, he never cut a piece of bread that wasn't his. Meaning he only ate from bread that was his. And from the day he became of age, his mind matured like Nehene Misudas Aviv. He did not enjoy his father's, he didn't enjoy from his father's meal, meaning he was totally self sufficient. He did not want to be supported by anyone else, didn't want to eat anyone else's food because Chai is noises atzmai. A live person is fully responsible. The, a, a live person who's considered to have the most life is someone who's an individual who's purely independent and responsible for himself and does not have to take from anyone else. Because if he has to take from someone else, then that takes away from his Ani. Because he's now dependent. To be a 100% individual, 
you have to be totally self-sufficient and not take from anyone else because chai and therefore chai is noise as atzma. A live person carries his own weight. Ad kan zayin.